Um, thanks for joining, and good afternoon. I hope you have been enjoying the session so far. Um, I'm seeing familiar faces and new faces, so welcome to you all. Um, in this section, we're going to have a chat with the, some of our leading experts in the field. Uh, I'm going to introduce them first, and then we'll go around and ask questions. If you get time in the end, we'll, ask, we'll open up the floor for the audiences to ask questions. So go easy on us. I'm old and old-fashioned, so I've written everything in my... Um, in a piece of paper to go through. Um, so I guess I'll start with our first guest, uh, Juan Yudo, who is a consultant and developer um, with a decade of experience in AWS, who has written two uh, books on AWS uh, AIM, Identity Management, and he also uh, <laughs> read the user guide. Um, I don't know who, how many of the audiences have spent time to do that well, task. I need to unfortunately change that because I read the user guide. Twice. <laughs> well, I read it when I was writing the book last year, and uh -huh. it was only 1,200 pages then. Um, so I thought that was a pretty good accomplishment. I went back to check it the other day, and it's now over 2,300 pages. So they had a bit of a formatting change. I think they jammed uh, some like identity center stuff in there. You know, there's a service rename. I yeah. the features to came out, again? and then uh, yeah, oh, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's a lot. Uh, I like IAM, but I don't know if I know like it that much, you know. How many pages are your books? Uh, my book's only uh, about 120, and okay. uh, I very deliberately didn't write 1,000 pages. I figured you could just read the user guide if you wanted to read it <laughs> that much. So, uh, so yeah, that was my claim to fame, but I, I need a new one now. And uh, only one of the books was about IAM. The other one was about AWS, and nice. you know, I did the classic author mistake where I wrote one, and so I'm never doing that again, and then the pandemic came along, and... I had a lot of free time, and for some strange reason, I thought it would be a great idea to self-publish a book. But anyway, I nice one. don't fully regret it, but uh, it's a nice lot of work. One. That speaks about the commitment and dedication <laughs> that you have to the topic. That's good. Uh, joining us as well, uh, Chris Armstrong, who is a software engineer at Honey Insurance with over uh, than 15 years' experience in cloud and architecture and enterprise development. So welcome, Chris. And not least... Last but not least, Saadi Abad, who has recently moved to Australia, so welcome. Thank you. Um, he is a co-author of um, this, the CDK book on AWS Container Hero, and he also is a practical docker with Python as well, so welcome. Thank you. All right. I know you all have been hearing good things about serverless days, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more good things about serverless today in the afternoon sessions. But I want to start our discussion with the challenges that we may all have faced dealing with, um, working with serverless day. So I want to maybe start a conversation. I want to ask the question from you, Chris. Uh, in terms of the architecture, what was the challenges that you have faced with ser using serverless days and how you overcome those challenges? So maybe you can start off with that. Um, so for me, one of the biggest challenges, um, so at Honey, we, we started with a new serverless architecture. Um, and when you start a company with a new serverless architecture, you have to hire developers, and um, not every developer is familiar with serverless. Mm -hmm. So um, I think for me, one of the biggest challenges, especially when you know it reasonably well, is to bridge that gap for people who don't know serverless that well. Um, a lot of people come with a mindset of um, like long-running enterprise applications, uh, batch processing systems, and that 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 adapting their thinking for a um, for a serverless system is probably the the, the hardest challenge I've found. Um, the way I've tried to deal with it, and I, the way that I find um, that helps, is to give developers um, lots of examples and um, to sort of teach by example, um, involving developers in the architecture process so that uh, they can understand some of the trade offs that you're making. Um, giving them a lot of patterns, I find that. Uh, developers will stick with what they know. So if you give them something, they will run with it, um, which can be good and bad. Sometimes you can end up with um, uh, pinball architectures, as they sometimes call them, where you've got a, a queue listening to a lambda, which sends something to a queue, which is, uh, lambda is listening to that goes to another queue, for example. But um, the yeah, that, that, that's been like one of the biggest challenges for me, like especially coming from a background where um, I, I, I sort of knew the path from enterprise, and I, I learned like the hard way. But not everyone has the opportunity to do that. So it's like bringing people up to speed is like is really important, and involving them in your thinking and how you think about architecture, especially if you're more experienced with serverless, is important. And um, if you're not, I would say the uh, 
uh, learning from other people's examples. There is like a wealth of um, serverless content online. Um, a lot of it really good. Uh, you do get a good feel for like ways of doing things. You shouldn't feel that um, just because a service is there that that's the that that's the necessarily the best way to do things. Sometimes simpler is better. I guess having that mindset shift, I guess that's the biggest challenge because we tend to stick to the things that we know and having that change is going to take a while. Yeah. I guess we will make it harder for ourselves to make that shift and transition. You mentioned security, Iran. Was there any challenges that you have faced in terms of... Um, um, yeah, look, I think it's probably related to what you're talking about there. You know, it's that mindset change. Your code is going to run so much closer to the actual platform, you know, the cloud provider itself. Uh, I think a lot of developers you know, traditionally are used to running their code on a server and, you know, the kind of boundary, especially from a security perspective, is pretty set in stone. You know, you get given a server, you run your code there, you know, network is the perimeter usually, but in the serverless context, that isn't the case. You know, the network you're running in is software defined. So this is where identity becomes the perimeter. And that's, I think, one of those key, you know, mindset changes that you're talking about there that uh, once you make that change, it becomes very easy to deal with. You know, I think that's one of the benefits of, of serverless. You just get that level of control. But until you make that change, you can actually, you know, butt up against it. And, you know, this is, I think, some of the source of the sentiment where people are like, oh, you know, I don't like serverless. It's, you know, just someone else's server, that kind of thing. Uh, it's because they're kind of missing the point. Maybe they haven't had the good practices demonstrated to them like you talked about. Mm. And uh, something onto that is... I find a lot of people, especially those who are new to cloud and AWS, they they kind of struggle to understand how IAM works, especially even now, because traditionally you've got a server running, people would put static keys and things like that, which is a, pretty much a no-no in the past, like decade right. plus, and you still see people using it. And you know when you tell them that there's an execution role that you can do, the concept of assuming rather the role chaining where you chain a role and then you go on and assume another role, it's like it trips a lot of people. Like they can't wrap their head around it and they still end up sticking back static keys. You know, like you have to go and chase them saying like, no, this is not how you do it. And I've, I've had to sit on Zoom calls and tell them like, this is how you can do it. And like they stare it with disbelief. Like how does that work? And like when you try to make them understand, they're a lot more comfortable. Like, oh, this is so much better. It's just have to put in a little bit of effort to make them understand that you know things have changed and you mm. can't just use long run keys anymore. Yeah. Nice. I want to dig in dig a bit deeper into the security side. So what are the key considerations for adopting IAMs in serverless lists? Is there uh, any so, like if you want to list down a few um, so if we're talking about you know security in general, mm. you know, I think we've uh, you know Sheen's talk earlier around just how you scope your functions. You know, I think this is a really and again, a common uh, tripping point when it comes to, to service applications and developers that are using service applications. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a one-size-fits-all approach, you know, Lambda Lith, microservice, nanoservice, we can all talk about that, you know, for the rest of the day and still not come to a conclusion. I think just picking one and, and committing to it is the way to go. And if you have to change it later on, well, presumably you're doing that because you have a good reason to do it. And if you don't, you don't change it. Uh, the other kind of security thing that probably isn't I think the, the most IAM related thing that I see, uh, and I'd be interested to know if it matches with your experience, uh, it's over provisioning. You know, and that's not really specific to serverless. It's more of a cloud thing where you know, I think it's probably related to you talking yeah. about the static keys. You yeah. know, they just get whacked on there and everything works. Because you know? I think for a lot of applications, the reality is security is a non functional requirement. Your application will work fine with admin privileges. But I think you know, most of us that have been around know that it's kind of like driving the car without the seatbelt on. Like you'll get to your destination and you'll be fine until you have an accident and then you're not fine. And then you have to explain to people why you weren't wearing a seatbelt. You know? So this is, uh, you know, it's probably a bit more cloudy than serverless specific, but obviously serverless is you know, cloud native for lack of a better term. And so I think that's um, you know, related. There's a bit of overlap, I think, between those things around scoping the size of your function and then giving those functions the appropriate permission. Uh, so I think that's probably the, the biggest IAM security issue I have. The other thing I think which is more specific to serverless and more of a security issue that's definitely been a hot topic in the AWS space these last couple of weeks is denial of wallet. Mm. Um, you know, if you get your kind of surface area of your application wrong, 
uh, and in you know, the case that was happened recently that has thankfully been fixed was around you know, how they charge for, serverless, uh, for sorry, S3 error codes. Uh, you know, the reality is I think most serverless applications can scale, if anything, too much. You know? And outside of a few very large scale problems that you're solving, you know, if I'm just building a web app that isn't trying to serve the entire world, chances are my serverless application can scale perfectly fine out of the box to the point where I can serve requests that I probably don't want to serve. Um, so I think that's another gotcha that, uh, you know, if you're coming from that server-based mindset, it's like, well, if I use all the capacity of the server, it will just stop working and I don't have to pay any extra. Whereas in serverless, pay as you go, you know, things like that, it can come back to bite you. You had a point on the uh, multi-cloud strategy, so maybe that's another question for you, Sadia. How does um, the serverless fit into multi-cloud strategies from the maybe operational point of view? Uh, <laughs> that's a, a, a very broad I, question. Yeah, no, I, I cry every time I hear the word multi-cloud because <laughs> multi-cloud means a lot of different things for different people. Uh, for some people, multi-cloud means, you know, it's like run the same workload everywhere. For some, for some others, it means uh, we're going to use a specific cloud for a specific purpose, mm. uh, for compliance, for uh, regulatory purposes. Uh, prime example being, you know, anything. Say, for example, Gov Cloud versus the General Cloud. That also is technically multi-cloud, right? Because there's a lot of disparity between them. Uh, it's really difficult to get. Like, usually, what happens is when you try to cater to multi-cloud, you end up catering to the lowest common denominator. And you just don't end up using cloud very well. You, people are like, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that, so we're just going to stick to using VMs, which defeats the whole purpose. Yeah. Uh, also, it's like a lot of people have made up their mindset serverless equals Lambda when there's equivalence in every cloud nowadays, if, for example, like this. GCP is cloud functions, you've got Azure functions, everything is that. So in, I think in general, uh, trying to come up with abstractions uh, which work across different cloud providers is the strategy you should be looking for if you really want to go to the multi-cloud. My personal take is, you know, unless you are really that much into regulated space or you really value that, uh, the data value that you have or whatever you want to run on, unless you really, really want to go for multi-cloud, don't go for multi-cloud. Uh, because the inherent notion is that you know you hear people from an operations perspective, you hear, oh, Terraform does multi-cloud, or you've got agnostic, uh, like you know, Boyan mentioned this, this agnostic uh, providers. But the reality is that there's so many different nuances that it's really impossible to have one implementation across all. So now you end up with abstractions, like you write a generic bucket uh, function which talks to uh, S3, which talks to Azure, and then you realize that Azure's uh, storage accounts and containers are not exactly the same as S3 buckets. So you start patching things everywhere. So it becomes a big pain. So if you really want to go for it and make sure your abstractions are you know, watertight, uh, that you've covered all possible cases. And you should be aware that multi-cloud is going to be a really expensive thing, whether it is in terms of engineering time or in terms of uh, just a sticker price, even if it is serverless, right? If you're not paying for anything for your resources, you still have to put in the time and effort required. And we're not even talking about, uh, from a personal point of view, leveling up people to make use of those better. And then your developers are probably tired of you know, having to deal with one cloud. Now they have to deal with the nuances of the other cloud, so it becomes really complicated. So just get your abstractions right. I know it's saying just is a really bad thing to say because People who have done it, they realize how difficult it is when you say just, just this, like, just do it right. You know, it's not really that simple. It's interesting what you say about multi-cloud because I'm quite used to working within the same cloud, um, and um, there's so much choice of services like within something like AWS. Um, so whether or not you're working with something like IAM or if you like something like Step Functions, sometimes it makes sense to constrain your possibilities a little bit to like to know what's out there, but. Uh, not feel like you have to incorporate that into your application. Um, most, most systems can be built uh, using a very small set of services. Um, sometimes you can substitute a step function for just simply a Lambda function. Sometimes if you're building out a, um, an API gateway in front of your application, you might be able to do that with just CloudFront and a Lambda running an internal router. Um, the, 
Uh, one of the problems uh, that I've encountered is that uh, once you give like a patent to someone, sometimes they run with it. Um, so like you can end up with an API gateway with one Lambda function for every single endpoint you have, and then you start running into problems for example, where you run out of IAM roles, which is actually an impossible one to fix. You can, you can bump that limit up to 5,000, but once you get to 5,000, you can't go any higher. Um, you can end up with step functions where you have like one lambda function per thing in the step function, but the idea behind a step function is that the, the, the units of work are reusable, but um, if you design up front for step functions, sometimes you can get into a trap where um, like your function is single purpose and can't be reused. So you've kind of like, um, although you've isolated your unit of work and you can take advantage of like step functions, retry capabilities, it's, uh, it's like transactional capabilities and it's uh, passing a state, sometimes you can make things more complicated simply because you're trying to um, map state in, in, a, in a YAML file, for example, if you're using uh, CloudFormation or, 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 or SAM, um, instead of just using data mapping in your language. So um, one of the things to keep in mind is that even when you're working with cloud primitives, there's got to be so much of an overwhelming advantage to certain services that uh, sometimes it is easier just to build within the code, especially when you've got like really good typing facilities available from your language or um, there's good frameworks available to you or you've already got existing patterns. Um, the more you increase the scope of what you actually use, the operational overhead goes up because there's more stuff that people have to know. Uh, tracing becomes harder. A lot of services aren't supported by every tracing provider. You might use X-Ray, which is great, um, but not even X-Ray supports everything. Um, so there is like a, there is a value to simplicity. Um, as, even if you're working within one cloud provider, if you're working across many, um, the advantage of being able to build to the platform is that it's got those capabilities for you, but those capabilities have to be uh, useful to you uh, more so than just uh, building it yourself. That's, that's a very interesting point. Speaking of uh, the services, whether to use and when and how to use those services in serviceless day, serviceless not day, serviceless uh, architecture. How about the DynamoDB? So, what has changed your uh, understanding of how and when we should be using DynamoDB in our serverless architecture? Was there any like consideration or a particular point that whether we should use it or not, or? Uh, yeah, that one's, uh, that's like an ongoing battle for me. So um, <laughs> I first saw DynamoDB being used really, uh, really badly as a relational database. And yeah. this was sort of well before the kind of single table stuff came out. Um, I sort of thought that after that, well, maybe you should just use a relational database. And I know relational databases um, can still have some issues with the serverless environment, especially with connection pooling and stuff like that. Um, the, we sort of went through single table design. Um, that was fascinating to me. So like I built a library for it and le uh, learned more about it. And I think we've now come down the hype curve on that. So people are now more responding to the idea that uh, the single table design is perhaps a bad thing. Um, uh, for DynamoDB specifically, um, or, and for any database that's like that's got like a very simple set of capabilities, um, there you can build um, everything inside a single table. I would say you probably shouldn't do that. Mm. Uh, like the the thing that came out of single table design that was the most valuable, especially for DynamoDB, was the idea of putting multiple types of data in into the same um, into the same uh, table. Um, because that, that gives you a lot of flexibility. Like um, they talk about needing to know your access patterns up front with DynamoDB. That's certainly the case, but um, at Honey, like we have built on DynamoDB and we add new collections all the time. We add new attributes all the time. We add new indexes all the time. Um, what you get used to is like constantly uh, backfilling and migrating your, your data. Um, but the, the thing to remember about that is as scary as that seems, uh, migration is a normal part of software development. We're always migrating one system to another because um, otherwise we'd never get on top of tech debt. Um, the systems where you cannot migrate or migrations become too difficult is where um, enterprises make the decision to rebuild, um, which isn't always the right decision, but um, from the perspective of like the history that they've had where they've not been able to refactor things or migrate things, um, you can sort of ossify around that. And it, um, the, the, with DynamoDB especially, you have to be prepared to constantly be moving your data. And it's not, um, it's not a un necessarily unsafe procedure, but it's just something you've got to keep in mind. Um, the, other, the other aspect I'd say when working with it is use a, use a wrapper library around it. The, the raw DynamoDB API is 
absolutely horrible, <laughs> um, and there's been very little to actually improve that. Um, there are libraries out there that, um, it, they're not really ORMs, but they do sort of simplify a lot of the access. Um, and that, that, I'd say that's really important if you want to use DynamoDB. Um, otherwise, like if it's not something you're comfortable with and not something that you're sort of prepared to make the investment in, like sometimes relational just is better, you will obviously have the operational overheads, like you lose the ability to just infinitely scale and all those automatic backups and that, but um, I'd say these days that um, the support for SQL databases is getting better, so um, you, we, we sort of, we're lucky to have lots and lots of options in that sort of SQL and NoSQL world these days. Um, yeah, giving those options gave you a chance to do the trade-off and choose the right mm. one, which is best for your application. I want to ask Ron, who's an expert in our security mm. side, if you want to go about and implementing the least pri access privilege in <laughs> serverless environment, how would you do that? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a popular question. I get it quite a lot, and unfortunately, I have to say up front, <laughs> there's no silver bullet. Okay, if oh. there was, I would give it to you, and we would all know about it, and everything would be great. And we probably looking just looking for two line of codes. We wouldn't be talking about least privilege anymore. It'd just be you know the truth. Uh, but things have got a lot better recently, or you know, over the last few years, and you know that's important in the cloud in general, but doubly so for serverless because your code is running so close to the platform and to IAM. Um, you know, I imagine it's the same on the other cloud providers as well because you're literally just giving the, the cloud provider, here's my code, please run it under these circumstances in this context with this authorization. Um, so things have gotten better uh, around the tooling. I kind of think about it in two broad ways. Uh, you know, there is the path of generating your policies and that gets you pretty far these days. It just doesn't get you all the way there. And so you really have to know the limitations around the generation tools. In an AWS context, you know, that's using IAM Access Analyzer policy generation. Uh, and there are some open source tools that will also work with that. Uh, the other way is crafting your policies. And so this is what I would normally recommend people building a serverless application do. You know, you should have an idea about what role your Lambda, or sorry, you know, your function or your system in general, could be your step function, whatever you know what that should do. So give it permissions to do that. Don't just give it admin and say you can do whatever you do, you know, whatever you feel like, uh, especially not if you're putting generative AI in there because who knows what it's going to do. Um, so, you know, you can craft this policy and then you can add to that over time. You can occasionally, you know, run into walls. You're like, oh, I forgot to give it that policy, you know, and it didn't work, but it's usually pretty obvious. The generation path is usually better for those teams that are generating policies for other teams. You know, so you might be a central team working with a lot of application teams that haven't necessarily been doing the best job in terms of scoping their, their permissions. So you might generate those policies for them and say, hey, I've given you this policy, confirm that it works first, obviously, and you know, that's where those limitations in the generation tools, you know, certain things like data actions aren't always picked up because many systems have so many data actions that it would be cost prohibitive to generate on those uh, specifically. So it's getting easier. I hope that it will continue to get easier and um, all things point to it doing that over the, you know, the coming years. Uh, but it's definitely not a solved problem as of today, unfortunately. Excellent. Sorry, go on. Go ahead, go ahead. I was, I was just going to quickly say, when you use granular permissions in your architecture, it can be harder, but um, one of the... It's, it's not always an advantage, but um, sometimes the thing that shows up is um, uh, your code smells. Like if you're building Lambda functions that have a lot of responsibility or they sprawl across um, lots of different resources, um, when you've used granular permissions, those things can some, sometimes bubble up and you can see where someone may have crafted something that's got access to lots of different things because they've written a Lambda function that touches everything. So um, when you're starting to build larger systems and uh, divide your application into multiple domains or bounded contacts, uh, sometimes the permissions is actually one of the first places where those, um, those architectural spells can um, start to surface. So um, when you use a too broad permission, sometimes it's very easy to hide um, the bad things your code is doing. Uh, I just wanted to say um, right now, I mean literally right now, uh, one of the projects that I'm doing is we've got a lot of legacy policies which are essentially action star, resource star, allow which is a pain to, to figure out what's happening mm. because it's a broad thing. And now if you just make it as deny, then now everyone's going to be complaining to you. It's like, hey, you know, you've broken my service. And uh, what we've been doing is exactly what you said. There's two aspects of it. One is uh, I'll go to the teams and 
the way we have we are structured is I'm part of the centralized cloud architecture team, uh, but we enable self service for our developers. So our developers can access or rather can build whatever cloud service they want. Uh, we enable them to do it via self service tools. Uh, for the legacy stuff, because you know there's a lot of accumulated tech that we go and ask them, hey, what are you doing with this? You know, what kind of services do you know? And they give us a broad idea of this is what I want to do. And just going through a lot of the IAM policy <laughs> manuals and uh, IAM access advice has been really helpful, uh, especially for serverless stuff, it's especially for lambdas because. Lambdas get this. Uh, they they run the. So I got to pull you up there. You said Access Advisor, which is a separate service to Access Analyzer. Access Analyzer. There you go. Access Advisor is the old one. So yeah. So Access Analyzer. So uh, we tie it to a, a specific role, and then you uh, yeah. put it into that, and it tells you all the things that it's been mm -hmm. using, and we put that in, and you know, give it, let it bake, and if it, uh, and we run it in, you know, in our test environments, if it works. Yeah. Yes. If, you, if you haven't used that, you definitely should because they added a lot more service support at reInvent, yeah. so it went from not being usable to being usable. Um, so definitely check that out. Yeah, I can definitely agree. Like, you know, it feels good to have validation knowing that the way we are thinking is, you know, how someone like yourself, uh, okay. you know, a certified IM specialist is like, yeah, that's feels that. good. <laughs> nice one. Cush us off the time before we I open up the floor for questions. The last question, maybe I start with you. What would you like to see in a serviceless space in the next few years? Uh, what it is that you wish for? Uh, I think a simpler way of getting started with serverless. There's, I know there's like getting into serverless is easier than ever before, but uh, my background is not dev. I'm more into operations and site reliability engineering. So whenever I start uh, with, I, I start off with the Lambda function, but before I get into a Lambda function, the first question is to Lambda or uh, step functions, which uh, you know, there was a great, uh, great talk by Clara over there. So that, that helped. Uh, but that's cheering that. And then, you know, even before that, what do I use? Uh, do I use SAM? Do I use serverless? Do I use AWS DLI? Do you use AWS console? And uh, I think if there's like a better way to get started-ish, uh, mm. there's too many documents, too many uh, opinions on how you should get started. If there's a simpler way of getting started, that'd be great for me personally. That's a very valid point. How about you, Chris? Um, so sort of on the same point, the, it, better ways to modularize um, uh, serverless solutions. So like when you're building on serverless, it's not usually just a Lambda function and a queue or um, like a, a Lambda function and li listening to an event bus. Sometimes you have like a string of services together and you want to be able to patternize that and um, reproduce it across your architecture. I'd say we're not quite there yet. Even things like CDK make that really obscure, they can hide a lot of details. Um, even a lot of the wrappers built around CDK hide those details. They can kind of understand why uh, frameworks like SST are uh, iterating on uh, Terraform. I'd like, it'd be interesting to see where they end up. I hope it's not the same place. I hope it's somewhere much better. <laughs> um, but yeah, like a lot of uh, code generation tools that generate infrastructure code don't do this really well. And I think we've still got a long way to go to um, be able to reproduce um, like important uh, architectural patterns and servers because there's just so much choice about what you can do. There's so much, um, there's so many options. There's actually lots of things you need to consider, like setting the right limits, uh, putting alarms on things, uh, uh, making sure like you don't, you're not susceptible to these denial of wallet attacks. Making sure that you actually know when something is breaking down. Um, there, yeah, there's just a lot that doesn't, you can't really capture it as a pattern, and the, I, I don't think the tools are there. So I'd love to see improvements in that space. Uh, look, I'm going to say something about IAM, I'm sorry. Um, you know, it's, it comes back to that least privilege thing. Uh, you know, I think you know, SAM does really good with its policy templates. Uh, if you haven't seen those, check, the, check those out. Um, CDK has come a long way as well with supplying those sensible default permissions you know, when you're deploying a thing. Um, so this has improved, but uh, you know, unfortunately, when it comes to security, you know, there's a lot of downside with getting it wrong. If you get it right, your application works, you know, yay, that's, that's kind of the starting point. If you get it wrong, things can go wrong in a bad way. So it'd be great to have, uh, you know, the maturity of the tooling catch up to that and just provide that secure, sensible solution out of the box, you know, kind of what you're saying about new developers getting started, you know, it's yep. enough work for them to just wrap their head around this new paradigm, yep. let alone, uh, you know, dropping in a whole lot of security requirements. 
one thought I had watching Clara's talk uh, just before is the, I, the permissions code that she was showing was yep. the same size, if not bigger, yep. than all of the actual lambda code or step function code she was showing. Yep. And that's the downside of granular permissions is that they're very granular. Mm. Um, but yeah, tooling to improve that uh, experience is what I'd love to see. And I, and I think we will, but it's, uh, it's a journey in progress, definitely. And we tag along the way, I guess. <laughs> nice one. I guess we are at time, but a lot of you are okay to take one maybe question from audiences. Are you going to deny people afternoon tea? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> I want to give chances. Deny. Oh, we can. Is there anyone that wants to ask a question? No? Okay, afternoon tea. <laughs> okay, that was easy. <laughs> anyone? One, two, three. Got a yellow. Sold. Oh, there is one. There's one. Oh, over there. Yeah. Shout Sorry, it out. Lars. Out. Uh, so, when you were talking about serverless iterating with Terraform, I didn't quite understand it. Explain SSD, maybe. Yeah. Oh, so it's, it's, actually, I think there's a talk after the break that will literally cover that. Matt, there, there, there he is, Matt's yeah. talk. Yeah, uh, SST is a framework for uh, building serverless applications. Um, it was built around CDK, which is an infrastructure as code generation tool. They're migrating to, I think it's called Pulumi now. Pulumi. I, I, I'm really outside of the Terraform um, ecosystem, which is quite sprawling from what I understand. Um, that I, I was talking, yeah. I hope in their switch of engines that their ability to modularize like solutions for, for developers um, and make them accessible and understandable improves with that, that transition. Cool. Thank you. Thanks Alrighty. for your time and sharing Thank your you insight. So Give a round Thank of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.